The Empress scarcely ever drank anything but Chambertin, mixed with a great deal of water. He had no cellar of wine, either at the Tuileries or in any of the palaces. The supply was contracted for by wine merchants named Supe and Perugas, carrying on business at number 338 Rue Saint Honoré. When it took to furnish the required quantities, not only at Paris and in the Imperial Chateaus, but also on campaign. One of them, for that purpose, always accompanied headquarters. They delivered the wines and liquors in bottles of a uniform shape, manufactured at Severus and marked with a crown N. They were only paid for the bottles consumed. The Chambertin, of uh, five or six years old, which the emperor drank, caused like the Romane, Clovisio, Montarche of the same date, and the Lafitte of ten or twelve years, six francs a bottle. And was so accustomed to Chambertin that he had great trouble at St. Helena to habituate himself to claret, so that it was one of the petty sufferings of his captivity. From the time of the Egyptian campaign, it was the wine which he drank solely, as he himself testifies, when after the victory of Elshingen, he went on to sleep at Oberfelheim, where he found that all his baggage was pillaged, even to a Chambertin, he remarked gaily that up to that time, he had not been deprived of it, even in the midst of the sands of Egypt. After all, this indulgence is the only one he was known to have, and it was kept within limits, for he never exceeded the half bottle. No other wine was served to Dejeuner, and no liquor after Dejeuner. There appeared on the emperor's table a service of silver plate, chased and decorated with the imperial arms. Some of the silver, however, dating from the consulate, was marked with a bay. With the exception of the dish covers, generally surmounted with an eagle, the silver in common use was very plain and kept to the ordinary patterns of salt cellars, for instance, were shells or swans or ornamented with caduceus. The oil crates were in the shape of swans. With the exception of the salt spoons, the silver gilt, everything was of silver. Silver gilt was only used dinner on Sundays and on grand occasions, contrary to the practice of the princesses, who were always served on silver gilt. But there was no lack of plate. From the time of the Egyptian campaign, General Bonaparte had for his own use serves a plate, very light and portable, which afterwards served as a pattern for what was called the hunting service, but he had only a few specimens left, all the general's baggage having been stolen between Frisou and X. During the consulate, he was at first compelled to be satisfied with little, and he was only able to supply himself by degrees. The service supplied by BNA in the year 10 did not consist of enough large pieces, and he was obliged at every grand dinner to hire. As to the table service, a set of white and gold porcelain was used, marked with a B in gold, supplied by Sejournon and costing, including cups and saucers, with garlands of laurels, carafes, and glasses richly cut, marked with a B. 23,463 francs, 30 centimes. Little by little and increased, add in the year 13. Besides the splendid service of silver gilt presented on the occasion of the coronation by the city of Paris, the emperor possessed a service of silver gilt for 24 covers, a new set of silver all marked with letter B, with 96 dishes for entremets, 96 entree dishes, 32 dishes for roast meats and the rest in proportion, but for dessert, as yet he only had the forks and spoons and accessories of silver gilt as a centerpiece. It was necessary to borrow from the guard mobile and Apollo driving the four horses of the sun, which on occasions was accompanied by various statuettes of Hercules performing labors. In 1806, the silver plate increased by a series of purchases, reached to the weight of 24,449 hectograms, completed definitely. In 1811, it was reckoned in the palaces of France only at a value of 2,193,301 francs 48 centimes, without counting 843,791 francs 74 centimes in Tuscany, in Rome, and in Holland. Napoleon always took his déjeuner alone, except during the very short time between his second marriage and the confinement of the empress, Josephine never took Dejeuner with him, and after the birth of the king of Rome, the emperor resumed his solitary habits, which suited him better, 
from the birth of his son, the gouvernant of the children of France, Madame de Montesquieu, was ordered to bring the child every day at the time of déjeuner. He took him on his knees, made him taste his red and water, and put to his lips a little of any gravy or sauce which came to hand. Madame de Montesquieu remonstrated. The emperor burst out laughing. It was for his son, and with his son, that he had his only noisy gaiety, and the infant king laughed with him. The empress was often present and was amused also with these little scenes.